Protea Conversations, the podcast where leadership in business and accounting isn't just discussed, it's explored. I'm your host, Zane Stevens, and thank you for joining me as we delve into the minds of some of the most influential leaders in the industry. Our journey is one of discovery, from unraveling the unique stories that shape our guests' careers to the invaluable advice that fueled their success. We are yet to provide you with a simple, actionable advice to accelerate your career and personal growth. Whether you're a budding professional or a seasoned executive, these conversations are designed to offer insights and perspectives that resonate with everyone. So tune in, engage, and be inspired as we build better leaders together. Welcome to Proteo Conversations. Today, we have Lucas Sundahl with us. Lucas has a really interesting story. He's the visionary behind Accounting Couture. Lucas's professional path is a testament to to the belief that with passion and perseverance, one can redefine their future and make substantial impact on others. Lucas's career began in the realm of physical fitness regarding his bachelor's degree in kinesiology from the Kansas State University to guide others as a personal trainer. However, recognizing the limitations of a demanding schedule, this career entailed Lucas seized the opportunity that would set him on an entirely new professional trajectory. His role as American Century Investments was a catalyst for a profound career transformation from guiding physical fitness to navigating fiscal fitness. Driven by a newfound passion, Lucas embarked on an academic and professional journey in finance, earning an MBA from Baker University with a focus on finance. Despite encountering challenges in the job market, his resilience led him back to Baker University to attain a bachelor's degree in accounting. The decision was not merely to step, but a leap towards his future. Lucas's dedication to his new path was further solidified by earning prestigious certifications certified management accountant and is certified in strategy and competitive analysis through the Institute of Management Accountants. With nearly a decade of experience ranging from project accountant to controller, Lucas has navigated the accounting landscape of both small firms and Fortune 500 companies. His journey is a reflection of his love for the profession and his commitment to excellence in every role he embraces. Accounting Couture is not just a firm. It's Lucas's mission to transform the perception of accounting from mere profession to a calling that inspires. Lucas believes in the power of accounting to change lives and wants to share his passion with the world. Through Accounting Couture, he is dedicated to promoting the accounting profession and supporting aspiring professionals through scholarships for finance or accounting credentials or licenses. Lucas invites you to be part of the movement that celebrates accounting, champions professional growth, and contributes to shaping the next generation for fiscal experts. With Lucas's journey as a blueprint, Accounting Couture is poised to inspire, support, and elevate the accounting profession to new heights. Lucas, absolutely ridiculous, <laughs> so impressive, and you are the epitome of the person I wanted to interview on Proteo Conversations, somebody that went from one space to another space through hard work, leadership, and just setting such a great example for everybody out there. So welcome to Proteo Conversations. Thank you. Glad to be here. It's quite, it's quite the story. I mean, it's not often that you see professional trainers go, shit, I want to be an accountant. So, so t- sort of tell us about that. Like, how did that even even occur? Yes. Yeah, so uh, obviously, like after college, I got a job at uh, a gym working as a personal trainer. I enjoyed it. But one of the things I found was that hours were focused on mornings, late evenings, a few lunchtime clients, but there's not a lot of uh, flexibility in that. And so I knew, like, long term, with wanting to like, have a family and do other things and have more. Uh, like free time in essence, especially like on weekends, because some trainers are usually, you want to at least have Saturday mornings where you're training. So I knew that long-term, it's not where I wanted to go. And so through my training, like going from uh, at the gym to in-home training, I met a lot of awesome clients, different backgrounds, CEOs, doctors. And then I just kind of got from there plugged into uh, an investment firm in Kansas City, American Century Investments. I got a part-time job there, turned full-time. And so it still allowed me to do some training in the mornings and evenings, but work there and realize that I wanted to pursue finance and accounting at that point. It's just so interesting because, you know, a lot of the friends, people I've known that were in that physical fitness world before, they're always transitioning into sales, like almost every single one of them. They're selling insurance or they're selling a product or they're selling something. Yes. Because they've taken advantage of the people skills that they've been developing with being able to work with people. And it's, refreshing to see a change from like i'm not going to run down the sales side though i've got a sales part of my business i'm going to go into accounting and 
it's still like I can't quite get my head around like how did this fitness guy get into the county? It seems so polar opposite from I'm working with people, I'm helping people to just like boring old accounting. Yeah, so I mean, for some people it would be kind of surprising, but I've always enjoyed math and numbers, and, and in a way, I still get to work with. Uh, people, it's not just usually like accounting teams and then like managers and executives. But one of the things like I enjoyed about training and that I kind of even do now is basically you're like, you're a storyteller. So with training, you're telling them like the story of like, okay, this is what's going on now. This is the changes that are occurring in your body. If you keep like exercising and eating right, these are the changes you can expect. And so that's transition to where I'm at now, where obviously like if we do better things like we manage these expenditures of better cash flow, that type of thing. So in essence, it's uh, a storytelling, but it's just a different audience and a different uh, it's accounting versus uh, fitness. I guess in both worlds, both you know, the physical fitness as well as accounting, you're, you're improving people's lives, even if it is a different aspect of their life. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I mean, you were in the finance world and a lot of people always say finance is way more exciting than accounting. So, you know, there, there's another like, weird little side journey that you took there from the exciting world of finance to going into the accounting world. What sort of made you decide that the more traditional accounting world is more is a better space for you than the finance world? So for me, with my background not being in accounting originally, I found that going the accounting route kind of like beefed up my knowledge and skill sets in that because even if you're on the finance side, having that accounting background and knowledge um, and like t able to take the historical data and make meaning out of it, so that's why I kind of pursued more of the accounting side is to beef up on those skills and accounting is the language of business. So having a thorough understanding of that has helped me whether I'm doing like a traditional accounting role or even like working with companies, um, like a financial planning and analysis. So I, it gave me a good background of both the backward looking and forward looking part of that finance and accounting role. Yeah, I don't think a lot of people understand like what sort of a, a difference the two worlds are but also how important that really can be to understand the accounting side. I know a lot of people in that finance world, you'll talk to them and they're like, hey, I don't have the accounting knowledge. I really need you to, to dumb this down for me because I just need this information. And they can't really always extract it, especially if you're a larger company where gap accounting is in play. I think it's a little simpler if it's you know gap-ish accounting. Yeah. Um, so that knowledge can definitely make a significant difference so that's you know just like highlight number one being able to do that is and identify that is, is so important so tell us about your company accounting couture and i know you've got uh, sunderful consulting as well and some other ventures but uh, i think the one that everybody knows you for is accounting couture yeah so basically it all kind of stemmed back from the pandemic of 2020 I had a lot of extra time like offices were shut down and i was working from home and my wife and i had come across like through friends this app called TikTok. People may have done it longer, like may know it as musically, like in terms of like that and what it does. But from there I was like watching these videos and I'm like, oh, it'd be kind of fun if I could tie in somehow like tie in accounting to that and make some videos that promote the profession, show a fun side of accounting. So like a, a few months went by and then I finally I thought about this for a while, but then one day I was like, okay, let's just I'm just gonna do it. So I I dove in Made my first video. It was super grainy, not very good video quality. And then from there, I've just continued to like find different uh, applications to make the videos better. I found some stuff now, like where I use like a, a, an application called CapCut. So they have videos that already have like other characters or things, scenes from movies and stuff. So it allows me to have a good mixture of myself in the video or just other videos that people may know from TV or movies. And just kind of tie it into an accounting theme. Uh, there's a lot of things about like taxes, even though I don't do taxes on a daily basis, but just tying in like obviously TikTok and other platforms, there's a ton of bad tax advice. So I'm always encouraging people to reach out to like, CPAs and enrolled agents that have a good tax background. And also through that, I wanted to make uh, accounting t shirts and I came across a way to design t-shirts and then not have to carry inventory. So that's another thing with accounting couture. And then some of the videos you'll see is like, I wear these shirts that promote like uh, finance, accounting, fun phrases, uh, life with a party, FIFO, you write to party. And so I use accounting acronyms and whatnot to make fun shirts that I sell to people. I've sold them like across the world. So obviously like I'm in the US, my customers here, but I've sold some things to uh, in Europe and some other places. So it's been fun to, not only make videos, but also shirts and then have people buy them. 
I even have some baby onesies that have been popular. Uh, so it's cool to see other accountants or finance professionals reach out and uh, get these shirts and just kind of showcase the accounting side. Well, there's a lot to unpack there, but I'm going to start with, I have Lucas's shirts before I do have two of them. The one, unfortunately, is now a sleep shirt because within 30 minutes of putting it on for the first time, I was uh, at a birthday party and happened to drop off my plate of food on the shirt. Oh, no. So it was a little damaged, but, you know, that's uh, luck luckily it was only a few houses away so I could go get changed. Uh, that's but, good, yeah. But it's uh, they're great shirts. There's a lot of really funny ones. I do like one of the, I'm not sure how new or old it is, but I saw it on your website as preparing for this uh, hiking the audit trail. I thought that was pretty awesome. Oh, so yeah, for sure. I might have to uh, invest in one of those before my, my summer hi hiking. Uh, not that I've been in order for a long time, but it, it's still a great shirt. Um, so that's really good. So talk to me about the TikTok world, because as you know, personally, I've never been on TikTok um, as an old man. That sort of has not really come into my world before. I'm I'm constantly uh, told by my SEO people that TikTok's a great place for accountants to be, but a little bit out of my comfort zone. So talk, just talk to me about that journey. I mean, being bored during the pandemic was is one thing but you know fully committing to it and making a part of who you are and part of your who your business is that's quite quite a step yeah so for me like a quick background like in high school i always so growing up i always enjoyed saturday night live and through high school like i was in music uh did sports and music and one of the things like the music thing had at the end of every year was a thing called variety show and what that meant was obviously people like could sing they could show the case their talents on piano but for me i like doing like comedy sketches and whatnot so sometimes it involved music sometimes it was just like a, a comedy sketch with like some friends and whatnot so that's like with tiktok there's a wide variety of videos on there some of it's like just informational some people are talking about like their business and so but there's like a lot of, some humor based creators and so i was like i wanted to take accounting and have like some things where i could try and teach people accounting but then also make it fun show like a fun side maybe some dancing that kind of thing and so that's where I kind of like delved into TikTok and just kind of tried to see what would work. Some videos didn't get a lot of views. It's just because of the algorithm. But then I found that using CapCut, like so, like incorporating movie scenes and other TV shows have been pretty popular. Yeah, and you, I mean, I've obviously seen some of your stuff on LinkedIn that pops up. Um, yeah, it's so weird though. The algorithm will just sometimes have you on my timeline, and then I just won't see you for for weeks again. I'm like, I, I don't know how these. Are. Yeah, and the thing is too, like if people getting started. So like my first year or so doing TikToks, my T-shirts were always backwards, and so then I finally figured out how to use like sometimes I'll use uh, Snapchat or like camera, and I've found different apps to like invert the image and add backgrounds and stuff like that. So it's an ever evolving process. So if people are like hesitant to get started just start creating you can talk about your business whatever interests you and go from there um, even if you don't have a huge audience I, for me it's just kind of a fun creative outlet yeah and that, that's such an important note for anybody i was uh, at a at quickbooks connect last year and there was a session with some of these you know major players in terms of the accounting content space you know people with hundreds of thousands of followers on different platforms and they all were just like just get started like you know, one of them was like Jason Stats, and he was like, I look at some of my first videos and I'm like, oh my goodness gracious, I don't understand who that person is. So it, it doesn't matter. Like, it, it's all going to be pretty sucky um, to start with. Oh, for sure. Yes. You know, you're going to learn along the way. Your first video is not going to be as good as your, your last video. And there's always going to be room for improvement. So that's just a, you know, really good point for, for anything in life is just get going and figure it out along the way. And as long as you're having fun, which sounds like you're having a ton of fun. I mean, that's all oh, that really matters. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. And then even throughout the day, like different ideas will pop in my head. I'm like, oh, I should write that down. So like I have a whole spreadsheet of different accounting acronyms and jokes that I've come up with that I'll, I'll throw into different videos and stuff like that. So it's a good way if you uh, just want to brainstorm, even if you don't make content, just brainstorm ideas to help your business. That kind of thing is also useful. Well, that was going to be my next question. What what does that process look like? What does that creative process look like time of day? Is it just like, you, it sounds like it's just a spreadsheet and as things pop up, you put it like, what does what your process look like? Yeah. So for me, my process is like, I, I have a spreadsheet. I have like, the different times of day, like ideas will hit me. So I'll jot those down. And a lot of times I'll usually make the videos like in the mornings. Um, I'm up early, like working on them. So some of the videos I'll just, I'll do in the 
in the morning, or if it's a video that's like a, a template and I'm not actually in the video, I'll do those like different like over the lunch hour, or even like evenings, like after dinner, sit down. And now I've gotten more efficient. So when I first started, it was like it would take me like 30 minutes for one video, even if it was a grand video. But over time, I've gotten more efficient. So I could do like even some of the videos with myself and then already knowing like what I want to talk about. I can get it done in like five to 10 minutes. Oh, that's really impressive. And you do most of them by yourself. You've got nobody helping you in the background. Yeah, it's just me. So, and that's the other thing too. Some people are like, oh, like, what do I do to get a camera? I'm still at the stage where I'm using my iPhone for everything. So some people, obviously some other creators are really good and they have like high quality content. I try and make the best quality content that I can. But everything I use is on my iPhone. So it's either the iPhone camera or other mobile applications. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, I just spoke to a, a movie director just the last year and I was like, hey, if we're doing like a video or something, what should you do? She's like, what iPhone do you have? I was like, iPhone 14. She's like, best camera in the world. Use it. It's good enough. I was like, yeah. okay. Yeah. Don't have to worry about it too much. Um, yeah. It's probably better than this grainy laptop like camera I'm using as well. But, you know, like you said, just make use of what you've got and, and do the best and have a process. And it's crazy that you're at a point where it's it's a 10 minute process to get a video done. That That's incredible. Yeah. And one of the other things is that like I found, it took me a long time, but when, once I found the TikTok feature where you can add for music and, and adjust the volume levels, that was a complete game changer for me. So there's tons of people like um, on YouTube and whatnot. So if you have like a small issue, like, okay, like, how do I do this? You can find ways to improve your video by adding some background music, but have it not overpower your voice. It's uh, pretty incredible. So next thing up is TikTok 101 by Lucas coming coming yeah, up, exactly. series coming through. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, I mean, I just learned the other day on Instagram how to add sound and uh, different oh, yeah. filters it's, and stuff. Yeah, like, wow, that's amazing. As well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's mostly... I mostly play around with it and it looks terrible. So I'm like, oh, I'll just stick to the boring old yeah. videos. <laughs> Much easier. I'm, I'm apparently not as creative as I think I am. Let's drop back a little bit. Okay. How long was your career in like physical fit? You have a whole qualification, which is super impressive. So, I mean, there obviously was a point in time where you thought like this was the way you were going to spend your life. Yeah. So I worked full time as a personal trainer for about five years. I've been. When I started going back to school, I still did training like in the evenings and the mornings. But yeah, I worked full time as a trainer for about five years. What I initially thought about doing was like eventually getting to where I, like, I would own my own gym, that type of thing. But even then, even if you hire other trainers, a lot of times you're still kind of managing and that's still a lot of early mornings and evenings. And so that's kind of what, after a few years of doing that, I realized I didn't want to do that long term. So I started making the shift. But yeah, I, I was a certified. I was a certified strength conditioning specialist. I was also a certified personal trainer for the NCSM. So like, I had two of the top organizations, like certifications in terms of uh, organizations and certified trainers and that type of thing. So yeah, I enjoyed it, but it just, yeah, it wasn't for me long term. I mean, any aspirations one day to go sort of back down that track once you've sort of called it your third career and get back into the physical fitness world? Maybe, like, I, for me, I guess the closest I'll be to it is like coaching, so right now I coach my two boys in basketball. So I still, in a, in a way, kind of have a little bit of uh, training. I don't think I'll jump fully back in, but I would love to like just like volunteer here and there, whether it's coaching youth sports or different things like that, and get back that way. You still work out regularly? Yeah, so my wife and I are members of a, a gym. It's kind of cool because they, it's like a circuit thing set up like upper body and lower body and they have like full body workouts and it changes throughout the week. So it's a high energy, like good music. They have trainers walking the floor. So you get focused attention a little bit, but it's also where you're not just with the trainer the entire time. So you get your workout done and then go home, but it's, yeah, we enjoy it. Yeah, glad you're still able to keep that part of your, part of your life going. Oh you look yeah. Like, you look like you're in good shape. So yeah, you know. thanks. Yes. No, I just, yeah, I definitely try and eat healthy and I definitely value, especially being a trainer. I definitely value, eating healthy and exercising for sure. Yeah, you got to stay pretty for those TikTok videos as well, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, shit. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's talk about the, the accounting job, the outside accounting couture. There's, there's, there's the actual accounting, the accounting role and the services you offer there. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes. Yeah, so I currently work as an accounting leader for a software company. In addition to that, I have some clients through like consulting work. So I do like some fractional controller, CFO work, some bookkeeping. 
so it's a way to um I just enjoy helping other people. So obviously, I, I yeah, I do get compensated, but I enjoy being a storyteller and helping people like make sense of their financial data. So sometimes people will be like, well, I have a bookkeeper, I'm good. But that's where having like a fractional controller or CFO is taking that bookkeeping data, which is essential to operate your business. But then what do you do with it? Like how do you forecast? What are your plans for the next one year, two years? So that's kind of something I do with my consulting clients outside of like my traditional accounting role. So you have consulting, you have a day job and you've got accounting couture where you're making a bunch of videos. Tell us just what your day to day looks like. It sounds like it's, it's chaotic, crazy, busy. You've got kids, you're coaching, you've got a wife, you're working out. Tell us about your day today. Yeah. So one thing I done, like when I went back to school when I was still training and I, I, I was like, I was working full time. I was, doing personal training and also going to school like i had um like in my mba program was like one night a week type thing so i got really good with time management so transform like our transfer to where i'm at today i get up early in the mornings i read my bible i go work out usually in the morning sometimes if i sleep in i'll go work out in the evening with my wife and whatnot but i get that done early in the morning i go to uh, my office like for my traditional accounting role and then uh, over lunch hour or in the evenings um, I'll come home, obviously, like, I interact with my kids, like, give them plenty of time, and enjoy playing with them. And then, so, I'll usually do some stuff, like, as they're getting ready for bed, I'll do some work then and whatnot. So, I've gotten really good at maximizing my time, still have plenty of time with my kids, but I try and do, like, my other consulting work, with like, early morning, like, I'll get home from working out, knock some stuff out, do some stuff in the evening, so it doesn't interfere with family time. And then basketball is going on right now. It's been pretty busy, but that's a couple nights a week. So again, it's I'm working with that, but it's also time with my kids as well. So it's a fun way to interact with them. I love sports, and so it's kind of fun to watch them to grow and get better. And whether they go on to play basketball in the future doesn't matter. But I just want them to have fun and uh, improve their skill set. Kind of thing. So it's it's fun to see kids progress from. The beginning of the season to the end of the season, especially with uh, my middle son, there's some kids that have never played basketball before. So it's just, it's fun to see the transformation. Yeah, it's my favorite part about coaching as well. I, I coach uh, my kids in soccer and my my goal is always that kid that comes in that feels like he's way behind everybody else to progress them through the season and watch them get better. It's mostly the most you know, rewarding because they are the ones that are going to improve the most, right? Because they're coming from the lowest base. So they, that percentage of growth is just so significant. So that, that I, I agree. That's like a great part of, of coaching, just seeing these kids develop. Oh, for sure. And then um, no matter like what sport they play, just having that base fitness is so good for them. Just trying to get them excited to be out there exercising and stuff. And hopefully that'll transform into them like later in life, even in, like just playing tennis or golf or doing something active. So just want to, like spur them and cheer them on so they enjoy like uh, being part of a healthy lifestyle. Yeah, I agree. My kids are, are still pretty young, six and eight. And I'm like, you will play every sport under the sun. When you get to middle school, we can thin it down. Yes. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot. It's the physical fitness, keeping them fit, learning like how important that is and good for their body. I think playing team sports teaches them how to socialize and interact with other people in a positive, respectful way, which, you know, doesn't necessarily happen on the playground where things can get a little less respectful and polite. Oh, for sure, yeah. And then the time management side of it, you know, I just see at the moment because my kids are really busy because they've got three sports going on at, at, during the winter, trying to figure out when they fit their home again, when they can go play outside, you know, telling them, hey, if you want to go do this, you got to give up on this later. I think there's a lot of good lessons from keeping them busy and active in sports that can, can make a big difference for their their whole lives. Oh yeah, that's one thing I love about the team sports is like the, the team aspect. You work through adversity, so like obviously, like losing a game is in the grand scheme is not that big a deal. But still, like when you're a young kid, that's like it's really like deflating. You want to win, but it helps them not only themselves deal with it, but like deal with it with their teammates and like work through things together. And so it's fun seeing the team come together, work together, problem solve, and whatnot. So it's yeah, definitely life skills in terms of not only the health wise, but like the skills that will transform uh, the workforce or just them in, in adulthood. Yeah, it's always trying to figure out how to teach that lesson to the kids where winning is not the most important thing, but playing in a way that you're trying to win is so important. You know, giving your best all the time 
is more important than the actual result. It's, it's a tough message to get across to emotional young kids who want to win, right? They just feel like that's yeah, the way exactly. they, yeah. they, 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 there's a good feeling in winning. So it's hard to tell them like, that's not, <laughs> that's not everything you, you, yeah, you gotta, exactly. got to learn yeah. to work hard and help each other out, be good teammates. Um, how does your, how does your day job feel about your side hustles? They've been good with it. So a lot of them like uh, have seen some of the stuff I've made uh, through LinkedIn or Instagram and whatnot. So it doesn't impact my day work at all. And so all the stuff that I do is like outside of normal working hours. And then a lot of times they'll be the ones that like click, like they like my videos and even every once in a while I work, they'll be like, oh, I saw the video the other day, like on such and such and thought that was funny. So yeah, they've been very positive about it. Obviously it doesn't impact my work at all. So they like make your content. It's all good. <laughs> That's fantastic. I mean, it's, yeah. it's you know, the accounting industry in general can be a little difficult when it comes to sort of these side hustles and jobs, but I think it's just like, it's the normal, it's a normal world, right? Everybody's doing something else. I mean, personally, I, I set goals for my team members to get on social media and, and do something. So I, I think it's, it's, it's great to hear that they're embracing what you're doing. Oh yeah, for sure. What is the general feedback being from people that you run into about it? Like, I mean, you are a, you're pretty, you are a celebrity out there on, on the social media world with, with some great content, especially with the, with the shirts. I, uh, every now and then I'll see a, a post pop up with somebody wearing your shirt and you know, it, everybody loves it. Yeah. It's been fun. So basically there's some people that may like work in accounting or finance and so they'll get the acronyms, but the ones, I, the stories I like to hear about are the ones where like, I didn't get your video at first, but I asked my friend who's an accountant, can you explain it to me? So. If anything, like if I can educate people, especially like with terms that are related to investing, and you could just even get them a little bit curious to like go search some stuff on their own. Like one of my shirts is uh, EBITDA instead of EBITDA. And I'm like, well, what is that? Well, then if people like go look up EBITDA and they're like, oh, okay, that makes sense. So I want them to, even if they're just like a, a high level overview, like an accounting term, they, they may laugh at the video, but also learn something in the process. So that's something I've found the most enjoyable as well. Yeah, I never even thought about it from that standpoint. As a note, that was the shirt that uh, they got the plate of food. Um, oh, yeah. Got damaged. <laughs> so one of my favorites. It was the first one I bought from you for sure. It was, yeah. it was a great one. Um, yeah, educational side of it. That's, that's a really good spin. I've never thought about, again, because I damaged mine so early, I didn't get an opportunity. But I can oh, imagine yeah, it's sure. a good, good, good conversation starter. They are. And that's another thing, too. So one thing I've found, um, just even like with going to the gym, it started some conversations. You'd be surprised, like, if you were curious, like, if you, like, are out like, grocery shopping or going to the gym, wearing some of those shirts, especially if you are somebody that works for yourself in accounting or finance, they're great conversation starters. People will be like, what is that? And then it starts a conversation. Oh, I'm a fractional controller, a fractional CFO. I have a bookkeeping firm. And they're like, oh, I need to talk to you or my friend Jeff needs to talk to you. So it's a way, um, free average, I mean, you have to pay for the shirt, but, like, it's a way to kind of promote your business without being directly, like, John's bookkeeping, you can just be like, oh, life with a party, what does that mean? And then you have a whole conversation about inventory and their bookkeeping. Yeah, fantastic. So it's a very interesting journey from physical fitness to accounting world with the, with the TikTok star all, all rolled into one. But can so, you share with us some of the, you know, some of the biggest challenges you've had along the way, your personal side, professional life, like I'm sure it hasn't been an easy road. So can you share with us some of the challenges you've experienced? Yeah, so definitely some challenges. Like when I was going for my certified management account designation, studying for that credential, obviously it took up a lot of time. So my wife was awesome in that process. We had two young kids at the time. So she was able to like, I was still able to help and whatnot, but she was very good about like, like letting me help, but then also having time to study and that type of thing. So having a helpful partner like spouse or, or friends, just like somebody there that can help you through the process was a huge thing. So that was like on the uh, personal side, professional side. Once I got my MBA in finance, my schedule was kind of funny. Was, I got my MBA first, but then I went back for an accounting degree. I was, once I was applying for jobs, a lot of them uh, required an accounting degree or a finance undergrad degree. And I was like, well, I have an MBA. I, I don't have all the hours and experience that, those degrees would bring me, but I still have like a decent background. And so that was a professional thing that kind of held me back. And so that's why I went back to school, got the accounting degree. And um, 
as I was working, like talked for a CPA firm, worked in industry, I was debating with like C CMA, CPA. Ultimately, I chose the CMA just because of like I was already in industry, kind of wanted to focus more on the management accounting aspect. There's still part of me that may pursue the CPA. So I, I haven't totally ruled that out, but I think just time management from the personal side and then just trying to uh, prove myself like not being a CPA, I feel like sometimes that's helped me back with some people. Other people are like, oh, you got you got experience, that's great. But there's some people, some hiring managers out there in the process, like if you don't have that CPA behind you, they won't really consider you. So that's something like on the professional side that's kind of I don't feel like it's fully helped me back. I still feel like I've been very successful, but I know it's in the in some of the minds of hiring managers and some roles that have not gotten in the yeah, and that's all just a little bit of propaganda, right? The, the, yeah. the only one that's done a good job of explaining who they are and what they what they give is the, the CPA qualification. I mean, I come from South Africa where my chartered accountancy qualification does the same thing. You yeah. know, I would get, get into, you know, through doors just because I have a chartered accountancy qualification. Who cares if he can do the job? Like, he's a CA. He's got to be great, right? Like, that's yeah, exactly. The, yes. So, yeah. which is not, not necessarily the case. I mean, you know, the chartered management uh, qualification is a fantastic qualification hell of a lot of hard work probably harder than you know getting this cpa qualification at the end of the day so you know people organizations need to do a better job of explaining who they are what they are and what they're producing um because there's a lot of great accountants out there that don't necessarily have the credentials or have no desire i mean i've been asked multiple times you're in the u.s why didn't you get a cpa i'm like first they expect me to write an english test before i start so that's I'm not dealing with that nonsense yeah, yeah, exactly. because I come from a country where English isn't the first language according English. to them. Yeah. So, you know, there's, there's all sorts of barriers that can create it. You know, you can just go on any social media and they talk about an extra 150 hours or whatever that, that is. And that can create all the issues, especially in a world of what is expensive to study. Um, it's not the end all and be all there's, there's other ways to get there. And I know a lot of great accountants that have zero qualifications behind them doesn't mean just because they don't have the education doesn't mean they don't have the experience and, and can do a great job yeah exactly okay let's talk about goals where are you taking this what are your short-term goals for any of the businesses personally what what does the future look like yeah so with accounting couture i just want to continue to promote the accounting profession my my goal still is to offer some sort of scholarships so I recently partnered with a friend of mine. He um, he's a CMA as well. He also is a CPA. He has like a ton of financial financial experience. But basically, we created a CMA study program, like Certified Management Accountant Study Program, to be like a lower cost alternative. So it's what we did. We focused on just building a really good test bank and some textbook materials that people could use to study. And so we just want to grow that course so people can either use it as a standalone way to study for the exam because we have all the learning objectives that come from the IMA for the exam are all there. A really good test bank, which I feel like is essential, like whether it's CPA or CMA or any of those credentials, you have to get really good at taking the multiple choice like tests and like really ensure and hammer home that you have that knowledge like built up and that type of thing. So that's one thing I want to continue to grow. So with the County Couture, I feel like that's where I'll focus the scholarship is to kind of help people go towards the CMA study program. That's still a work in process, but I want to grow scholarships, continue to promote the profession for both people that are currently in like high school, encouraging them to go into accounting, people that may want to change careers to accounting. It's a rewarding career. Um, I then also want to show like, I feel like sometimes, especially at the college level, there's so much emphasis on uh, audit and tax, which are obviously very important, but I want to show like the other roles in industry that you can serve as junior accountant, senior accountant, financial planning analysis manager. There's other roles in addition to audit and tax. And as you get that experience, then you could shift over here and there's find different ways to get to accounting manager or FP manager, controller, CFO, that type of thing. So that's another objective is just uh, goal is to promote the profession uh, for high school kids, as well as people that are like in industry somewhere else, and maybe they're in like IT or something else, and they want to switch to accounting. It's not quite part of this conversation, but I'm going to jump there anyway. 
we all know that there is a bit of a pipeline issue with accountants coming in the system. We know there's a ton of people retiring. There's not enough people studying accounting or staying in accounting. How do you think we get more people involved? I mean, you've got some ideas. So I'd love if you could just like maybe share one or two just for the rest of us to sort of get that, get behind you a little bit. Yeah. So actually there's a recent video from Blake Oliver, who's a CPA here in the U S and he was talking about on his podcast ways to potentially get people to get into accounting. And one of them, like just instead of the 150 hours is doing like accounting boot camps. And I even posted about that as like on my LinkedIn page and some people um, were on board with it. And some people shot back like, Oh, you need the hours. And, and then they're like, why wouldn't I want somebody to do surgery? That's never like had experience. But my whole point is, this is just to get them in the door. They would still have to take the CPA exam. They would still have to prove themselves like in the fundamental knowledge. This isn't like some weekend boot camp, and you're like, oh yeah, now you can do accounting. It would be similar to like the software industry where it's like heavy, intense coding, and you're working on what like accountants would do on their sort of advanced, like heavy tax work, heavy audit work, or the kind of work you see in the industry somewhere. So. I feel like the boot camps or some other similar study program would be very in depth. It wouldn't be like some weekend thing. And then you're like, oh, you're a CPA. No, you still have to meet the requirements for like passing the exams and getting like the CPAs to sign off on it. But that would kind of be another alternative that, for them instead of having to go back to school and spend two or three years in classes when they may have already had enough experience in the workforce that would satisfy those like, college credit hours. So. I feel like through boot camps or other coursework, uh, other alternatives, there could even be CPA firms that kind of host these uh, career changes, if you will. They could have them go through their own program and then bring them up to speed over like, go through like the base coursework and then like one to two years of like working with these CPAs, you get the experience and whatnot. So it's just a different is what I would like to see potentially. Yeah, I mean, I, I love that. I mean, two thoughts. One, a profession that complains that there's not enough of them and there's too much work. Um, clearly, there's a bunch of people who want to raise the barriers even higher to make it harder for people. But, you know, I guess you're, you're yeah, going to see that's that. That's the thing, too. Like, there's some CPAs that, like, became CPAs well before the 150-hour requirement existed. So, yep. obviously, they're still really good at accounting and they've shown themselves professionally. So, I don't get why this, like, yes, you want to have, like, a base knowledge but I don't think we should get hung up on some specific number and prevent somebody from becoming a CPA if they can prove themselves by passing the exams and meeting all the other requirements. Like that's that our requirement isn't like, oh, you just get hung up just there and don't yeah. have to worry about passing the exams. You still have to meet those criteria. Yeah. And I mean, this seems like a, like, you know, if you want to become a plumber or electrician, that's the type of programs they have, right? It's effectively some sort of boot camp through internship where you get yeah. experience before you take the examinations to be able to be certified in that space. So why wouldn't it work in a profession like accounting? I mean, anybody can, can become a bookkeeper nowadays, you know, getting certified for to be a QuickBooks certified person is not very difficult. You just go watch a bunch of marketing videos and then you take an examination on the marketing videos and you're certified, right? It's not... Yeah. It's not tough. So why not create a program where people get really good experience from really smart people to set them up so that, you know, the people that are coming in from the fringes are getting good experience. They're good accountants and uplifting the community rather than sort of keeping it at a mediocre level. Yeah. And it'd be like an apprenticeship, which I feel like those have kind of just totally gone away, but that those have obviously in the past been very successful. So you bring on an apprentice and then they're like in the weeds right from the beginning versus just studying like theoretical concepts in a book for a year or two and then actually then going applying it. Maybe applying it day one as an apprentice or working through these boot camps with the uh, CPAs. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Um, what, what sort of piece of advice did you receive in your life that helped you with your, the success that you've achieved so far? So I feel like for me, it's definitely like uh, networking with other people but in a way that it's not like a one-way street. So I feel like networking that I try and do also is like when I meet other people, I try and get, I truly get to know them and see if there's some sort of benefit or service or something I can provide them, something of value. And then maybe down the road, they have something to help me. So I feel like networking is a huge thing, but look at networking as a two-way street. So it's not just like a 
give me, give me, give me, like, what can you all, like, what can you provide to other people in your network that they can find valuable? So if you were in a accounting, maybe you've helped some people that are like in IT or other fields, like even with some basic accounting advice for their business and whatnot, and just have a, a symbiotic relationship. And then the other thing is uh, don't ever burn bridges. So like, even if you work at a company, and you don't really like it, try not to burn bridges because there's been times where I've left companies on very good terms. And then I've like years later, I've met another person from the company, done some work for them or just had them in my network to like as a referral source and stuff. So even if like you feel like whatever job you're in is like the worst job ever, I'm just going to walk out one day. Try not to like try and make it the best you can until like while you're looking for something else, but always try and leave um, a job or role on good terms because you never know when you run into that person again or somebody they worked with. And if you burn some bridges, it could not be good for you <laughs> in the yeah, long term. Yeah. That's some really great advice. Uh, one, I would say everybody should go read the book, uh, the go-giver. We'll get some really oh, good. Yeah. Ideas. That's a great book. Yes. Yeah, really great advice on symbiotic relationships and how giving will lead to more receiving, uh, which is yeah. wonderful. The other one is there's another accountant that I know. His name is Britt Summeril, and uh, he's a now CFO. And he sort of taught me that when you go into a one-on-one -on -one meeting with people, always try to figure out how you can refer them to somebody from that phone call. Uh, so keep your sort of black book open and figure out what would be a good connection for them in terms of service provider, potential referral source. And what is even more special that he does is when he gets on a phone call with a potential client, his goal is to walk away with an introduction to at least three other professionals from that call for that person, even if they're not going to become a client, so that there's some way to help them as well as help his network potentially grow their, you know, their businesses as well. And that sort of constant networking with the idea of giving uh, can make such a big difference um, because, hey, I'm going to refer something to you if you're a person who generally gives, you know, it's just the way human nature works. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's fun to give and help other people. That's one thing, like, even like as a trainer getting paid for it or an accountant, I still, I, even when I'm compensated, there's still things I try and provide others and try and give them value and that kind of thing. So uh, I try and go above and beyond and provide as much value as I can by what I'm doing. Yeah, that's great. So if we had to go back in time, what advice do you wish young Lucas had received out of his career? That's a good question. Um, I wish that somebody would have told me early on, like, hey, you're switching to accounting. I think you should do both the CPA and CMA. So obviously the CPA may still be in the cards for the future, but I feel like anybody that, um, like starting out in accounting, I feel like the CMA is very valuable. But I feel like if you partner that with like a CPA, it's just, uh, or like, like, we're, like in the US, every country is the chart of accountant and CMA because the CMA like is a global credential. So I feel like if you have a credential that's in your like, country, go for that and then pair that with a CMA or like if you wanted to audit it or whatever else, just pair those two together. And I feel like that will help you with job prospects and that kind of thing. So um, yeah, I wish somebody would have kind of Really, kind of like, hey, I think you should really go for the CPA. Uh, I'm happy where I'm at now. I still may do CPA, but I feel like that would have been a good thing to do even just a few years ago. Yeah, it, it always feels like from everything I see online, you know, about becoming CPAs and all of that, there feels like there's a big need for better mentorship and sort of career planning for people that sort of feel a calling to the accounting space to really understand what's available to them and what what would that path actually mean to their career. Um, so I, yeah, that, I, mean, I think all of us could do with a little bit of better guidance. I mean, I mean, I got into accounting cause I was in high school, was got good accounting grades and was good at math. So they're like, go do accounting. You'll be amazing. Oh and yeah. Went, yeah. And I went to a course that was like the most like vanilla ever. It was a BCom accounting for chart of accountants, you know, okay. no electives. I just went in, yeah. studied, did my undergrad, postgrad work, went and worked for an audit firm, became a chart accountant super easy, but it's not that simple anymore. Those types of, you know, single focus routes don't really exist. And as we're finding out, most people's uh, career journeys are, are not very linear. There's, there's, there's some twists and turns along the way. So Lucas, you are obviously a leader to the community. You're a leader in the accounting space, showing us all how it can be fun. You're a leader out there coaching your kids on the basketball court. What advice would you give listeners in terms of being better leader to the people that look up. 
Yeah, so I feel like one thing that would help leaders be better in their role is, especially like as you progress in your career and have more like experience, like work experience, life experience, is just to find people that you can help mentor. And in the process, you could you can still learn a ton of information that would help you as a leader grow, but then you'll impart your knowledge to younger leaders and just kind of just perpetuates. And so you're helping yourself, but you're also helping them. And so I feel like I wish there was more, uh, not only in the county, but just in the workforce in general, I wish there was more mentor-mentee relationships where people that have had like a, like a great career, a lot of experience, could really impart their knowledge on younger professionals and help them grow. And in the process, like th through teaching, like as you teach people things, you reinforce your knowledge and you learn things. And maybe it's like, oh, I'd love to teach more people, but I don't know how to use technology. Well, then find a mentor, like a mentee, like that has uh, less experience, but is really good with technology, can help make you make, help you produce content and just find like a relationship like that. So I feel like finding more or building out more people uh, where they f seek out mentors and create mentor programs and be a helpful to, uh, for existing leaders and help future leaders grow. Yeah, that's great advice. We're also scared of sharing our knowledge because we feel like we're going to be replaced. But yes, yeah, we all get better if we share the knowledge. We have to lift each other. And who knows what you can learn from those people that you're supposedly teaching. Yeah, exactly. I feel like um, even in the, like we're, the places I've worked now, there's still that like silo mentality. Like, well, if I let them know this knowledge, that'll like hurt me. But I feel like the more you impart your knowledge on other people, it just helps you even more so. So whether it's like you free up more time for strategic planning or other things, imparting your knowledge not only helps you, but helps other people as well. Yeah, that's great. So you've shared a lot about who you are as a person, uh, from your faith to your workouts, to your wife, to your kids, to your coaching. Is there anything else that you just love to share with the audience? Something interesting about you that will give us an insight as Lucas the person? Yeah. So for me, I enjoy uh, being creative and whatnot. So when I originally went to college the first time around, even though I finished with a kinesiology degree, I had majored in art for a while. So I enjoy creating designs through Canva graphic design obviously there's people that like that's their full-time role but i feel like it's somebody that doesn't do that much and just kind of dabbles in the in uh, as an accountant uh, that's one thing i enjoy so people may not know that like all these shirts on etsy and different places are all shirts that i've designed so it's kind of a fun way to let my creativity out not only with the shirt design but also the content and the video production and whatnot so i enjoy making people laugh and so I'm not going to be, become a stand-up comedian by any means, but <laughs> I enjoy making stuff that will brighten people's day, uh, help them laugh, that kind of thing. Yeah. So just for everybody out there, not everybody's a boring accountant like me. Yes, most, exactly. most of the rest of them are, uh, are really interesting and have this creative side to them. So that's amazing. Uh, Lucas, we like to end our conversations with some rapid fire. So if you're ready, I have questions for you. Yeah, I'm ready. Great. What is your dream vacation? So my dream vacation, um, any, any kind of beach. So I love going to the beach with my family. So it doesn't matter where it is in the world. Just uh, I love a good beach vacation. Okay. You got to pick one. What, what's that beach? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, so I feel like somewhere in the Mediterranean, I haven't been in that area of the world. So I feel like a Mediterranean vacation with my family would be ideal. Yeah, sounds like a great choice. Do you prefer audiobooks or paper books? So that's a really good question. I prefer paper books. Just like I feel like that turning the page and the sense of accomplishment, watching your bookmark move towards the end of the book. Uh, I definitely use and leverage audiobooks a lot. But for me, just having that physical book is something I enjoy. Yeah, there, there is something special. I like uh, going to secondhand bookstores and, and looking for something fun, fun to read. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Right. yeah, that's always a great way. Spend some time. Uh, if you had 20 minutes to exercise, what would it be? So for me, um, it would be a, like a full body workout to where um, like things with jumping, push-ups, some plyometrics. So a total body workout. So I'm using like, obviously like muscles to like a little bit of strength and resistance, but also getting some cardio benefit as well. Always a great choice. Uh, what is your favorite piece of technology that you use at the moment to make your life better? Uh, that's a good question. Honestly, I feel like I know some people like uh, technology with phones is uh, you can get spend too much time on them but I, I do try and limit myself on my screen time but i still feel like with my iphone the way like it can connect me for like research purposes or content production it just makes my life more fun it's a great tool 
Last rapid fire question: What was your favorite childhood meal? Favorite childhood meal? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so, I feel like for me, like my dad's mom was a really good cook, and so I think uh, one of the meals that she would make, and then also in terms of like, I feel like uh, one of her meat entrees she would make, and that's where I like I still eat a lot of cottage cheese even today, like because it's a good protein source, but. Like one of her entrees, and then like a good serving of cottage cheese on the side was like one of my favorite meals. Can't go wrong with some some home home cooked food. And with that, we end another Proteo Conversations. Thank you for joining us in the journey of learning and of learning and inspiration. Today, we've gained insights from our guests and taken another step toward understanding the diverse tapestry of leadership in business and accounting. Remember, each conversation is a step towards the positive transformation of business leaders. We hope our discussions has given you a valuable takeaway to apply to your own career and life. Don't forget to subscribe to Proteo Conversations on YouTube and Spotify so you never miss an episode. We'd also love to hear your thoughts and experiences, so connect with me on my social media channels. I'm most active on LinkedIn and would love for you to join the conversation. Join us next time for more engaging stories, advice, and conversations that matter. Until then, keep striving for excellence and embracing growth. Thank you for listening. Be kind and goodbye from Proteo Conversations.